Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Laura Kovacs, and it is my pleasure to introduce our guest this evening. In fiction and nonfiction, Gish Jen explores themes of alienation and identity, but also artistic expression and the self, as she challenges us to ask how the cultures we are steeped in influence the stories we tell. She is the author of four previous novels, a story collection, and two works of nonfiction. Most recently, The Girl at the Baggage Claim, explaining the East-West culture gap. Her many honors include the Lannan Literary Award for Fiction and the Mildred and Harold Strauss Living Award from the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Set against an American backdrop even more catastrophically divided than our own, her new novel, The Resisters, is a dystopian tale of a family confronting the digitally empowered authoritarian state and an underground baseball league. Please welcome Gish Jen to the Free Library. I want to say thank you all for coming. I know everybody would really be would rather be watching the debate. And I, I have to say that I myself put myself in that category. <laughs> and I will say too, you know, I haven't been here since I think 2004 maybe, or through 2000, anyway, yeah, 2004 I think is the last time I was here. And that evening also was the evening of a presidential debate. So, you know, it's just um, me in Philadelphia, it's just cursed. But in any case, but I am happy that you are here. And, um, and um, this is, I have written a very unusual book. Um, you know, in the course, this is my eighth book, and of course I've heard like every possible question over the course of my career. Um, but none of the questions have been quite like the question that I seem to be getting with this book, which is basically like, what happened? <laughs> like, what happened to you? Um, and, and, that, and that is because it is a post-automation surveillance state feminist baseball dystopia. <laughs> exactly. What else, right? And so people want to, like, like, what happened? You know, there you were going along, writing about East-West cultural differences and so on. And what happened in a nutshell is that my daughter went to college, right? So she went on, so that was my younger child. So all of a sudden, I was an empty nester. And of course, like all empty nesters, I cried, I cried, I cried. And then slowly, slowly it dawned on me that, you know, I had more freedom than I'd had in 28 years. Um, and moreover, because my daughter, um, I had just been saying to my daughter, you know, kind of have fun, explore, take risks. You know, as I sat down, I thought, well, maybe I should also, you know, have fun, explore, take risks, right? And, um, and you know, and, and, but the thing about it is, of course, and <laughs> those of, of you who are parents will appreciate this, so even though I had expressly given myself permission to write about anything, Right, just anything. Um, lo and behold, um, I did not write a you know a book about a girls' weekend in Paris, you know, involving devastatingly handsome men and designer drugs. Um, instead, with all my freedom, I chose to write a book that's really about parents watching a child grow up and go out into the world. Um, but you know, there I am. I am watching my own daughter go into the world, and I have two feelings. You know. Um, one feeling is, of, well, three feelings. I would say one feeling is just worry, the worry that all parents have when they see their kids go off to college. You know, it's just like, will they get involved with the wrong guy? Will they, you know, get involved with the wrong activities? Um, all of that stuff. But I also, because I had this sort of the citizen worry, you know, because I looked at the world that my daughter was going into, and I, you know, I worried. It was 2017. Um, at that point, we were 10 months into the Trump presidency, and it was being, becoming clear that, you know, that it wasn't just that this person might have policies that we might not agree with, but that you know, democracy itself was on the line. Um, that, that year, too, we'd had many, many storms. So one after the other. Every storm was like the storm of the century, except we had like five of them. You know, I mean, it just went on and on. Um, um, also that year, I don't know if any of you will remember this, but, um, but uh, Facebook was running an experiment with some chat bots. And the chat bots started talking to each other in a non-human language, you know, in a language so that the programmers themselves could not understand what the chatbots were saying. Facebook actually closed that experiment down. People were so freaked out. It precipitated a big back and forth between Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk about artificial intelligence. But you know, that was something to think about also. And um, 
you know, and, you know, I mean, now that there weren't hopeful things too, I mean, that was also the year that um, Colin um, Kaepernick took a knee. And um, I'm sure that, you know, had he not done that, would I have thought about sports and sporting events as a site of resistance? I don't know if I would have thought of that, you know? Um, but it's hard not to feel that those things are connected. Um, also, um, there's knitting in my book. You know, people say, why the knitting? You know, where does that come from? You know, why, you know, look, you, when you're writing, you're kind of in dream state. You're not always aware of where your ideas are coming from. But, but in retrospect, I have to say that had we not just had the women's march with all those hats, you know, I'm not sure that I would have thought of knitting, you know, but of course knitting, it wasn't just the hats, you know, that year a lot of people were wrapping trees, you know, they were, they were knitting around trees, they were, you know, they're knitting around toilets, you know, I mean, they were encasing all kinds of things with knitting. And I think that this was part of this, um, this feeling that, you know, for women, it was kind of a, it was, it was a new point in the women's movement, you know, that, and that it wasn't just about women sort of becoming like men. You know, there's a real feeling that we actually had to feminize public life. And, um, and so that was also one of the things that fed into my book. So, you know, I'm just going to read two very brief um, sections. Um, and then I'll take questions. Um, but I will say that you know one of the other questions that I've gotten a lot of in this book is you know is why baseball? And um, there are a lot of artistic and thematic reasons for baseball, as you will hear. Um, but I will say that there was a personal reason too, and that is that um, baseball is a sport with which my, neither one of my children has had anything to do with. <laughs> to the best of my knowledge, neither one of them has ever made a, a bat actually come in contact with a ball. Um, neither one of them can catch, and certainly neither one of them can pitch. Um, although I will say that, um, that that is true, and it is also true that my family, like many um, immigrant families, actually has a very intimate relationship with baseball. Um, my, my parents were Chinese immigrants, and that meant that, like many immigrants, you know, one of their first experiences, one of the first ways in which they kind of performed Americanness, was to go to a ball game and to have, you know, a hot dog. Um, and in my mother's case, especially, that turned her into this baseball fanatic. I mean, you've got to say, my mother is the least athletic person you have ever met. <laughs> but she is an avid, avid Yankees fan. Um, so much so that a couple of summers ago, she, she's in her 90s now, and um, a couple of summers ago, she was in septic shock. She was comatose. She was non-responsive. You know, we're all rushing to her sick bed. You know, um, a priest has been called in for last rites. And my brother, you know, just desperately, you know, leans over my mother. He's trying to get her to respond, you know. And what does he say? He says, he says, Mom, he says, the Yankees are in a slump. This is a true story. She says, the Red Sox are eating their lunch. And my mother her, opens her eyes. <laughs> And without missing a beat, she says, that Aaron Boone should be fired. <laughs> Aaron Boone is the manager of the, of the Yankees. Just like that. So when I say we, you know, um, baseball was actually, so simultaneously, it was not anything that my kids had anything to do with. So, you know, I could write about it without being, being decapitated. Um, but also it was something with which I had um, a lot of visceral attachment. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit from the beginning of the book first. Um, the family of the book, um, this book is told from the father, um, father's point of view. His name is Grant. Um, he has a wife who is a very fearsome, legendary uh, lawyer. Um, he has a daughter who is a pitching prodigy, although in the beginning of the book she's just been born. Um, and this book is set sometime in the future. You know, I don't really say when. Um, and, and you'll hear Aunt Nettie referred to. So that's the way that they refer to something called the auto net. So if you imagine now we have 4G. Most of us have 4G systems that our, our phones are running on. And we have 5G being rolled out, right? Um, but if you can imagine some world where we have like a 9 or 10 or 11G. You know, so this is, a, this is, a, is a, an internet that has a lot of automation and AI built to it, into it. And it's also integrated into what we might Thing today of is Alexa, except for it isn't just Alexa now. People's whole houses talk to them, and are, and, and are um, part of the system, and um, and the system is being used as our systems are today. You know to surveil them, um, and they call this this they, they call this AutoNet system Aunt Nettie. Okay. 
so this is, um, oh, I should also say also, in this post-automation world, there are two classes of people. One is the netted, people who are affiliated with Aunt Nettie, and, then the, and who have jobs. And then there is the surplus of people who do not have jobs. As her parents, Eleanor and I should have known earlier. But Gwen was a preemie to begin with. That meant oxygen at first, and after that, special checkups. And her early months were bumpy. She had jaundice, she had roseola, she had colic, she had a heart murmur. Things that I can now see distracted us. Especially with the one chance policy, we were focused on our health to the exclusion of all else. For the netted, it was different, of course, but for us surplus, the limit was one pregnancy per couple. And Eleanor was just out of jail. Outside the house, she had a drone minder tracking her every move. The message was clear. She was not getting away with anything. And in any case, we loved Gwen and would never have wanted to replace her, worried that we were that she was delicate, that she might never consume the way she needed to, the way we all needed to. Not that charges of underconsumption couldn't be fought in the courts. This was auto America, after all. For all the changes wrought by AI and automation, now rolled up with the internet into the I burrito we called Aunt Nettie, we did still have a constitution. And if anyone could defend what was left of our rights, it was our own fierce Eleanor, of whom even the platoons of Canadian geese who patrolled our neighborhood, the pit bulls, one might say, of the waddling world, were afraid. But as Eleanor's incarceration brought home, these battles had a price. And in the meanwhile, even worrying and weighing the options distracted us from realizing other things, things we might have noticed a bit earlier had Gwen had a sibling. It is so hard for a new parent to imagine a child any different from the one he or she has. Children do so have their own gravity. They are their own normal. And so it is only now that we can see that there were signs all children take what's in their crib and throw it, for example. It's universal. But Gwen threw her stuffed animals straight through her bedroom doorway. They shot out, never so much as grazing the doorframe, and they always hit the wall of the staircase across from her bedroom at a certain spot with the precise force they needed to bounce forward and drop clean down to the bottom of the stairwell. Was she maybe two when she did this? Not even, although she was already a southpaw. And already she seemed to have unusually long arms and long fingers. Or so I remember remarking one day, not that Ellen and I had so many babies on which to base our comparison. Ours was just an impression. But it was a strong impression. Her fingers were long. I remember, too, having to round up a veritable menagerie on the landing before I could start up the stairs. The stuffed hippo, the stuffed tiger, the three or four stuffed dogs, the stuffed orca and toucan and platypus and turtle. I gathered them all into my arms like the storybook zookeeper of some peaceable kingdom. It was as if I, too, ought by rights to have been made of plush. Of course, our house was automated as all surplus houses were required to be by law, and the animals could easily have been clear-floated. All I had to do was say the word, and the house bots would emerge from their closets, their green appendages poised to help. Clear-float now? Aren't those animals in your way? And we can roll in clear if you'd prefer. You have a choice. You always have a choice. The choice business being a new feature of the program, a bit of cyber ingratiation, you might say, to balance its more habitual cyber intimidation. If you trip, it will be your own fault, for example, and do note that your choice is on the record. Nothing is being hidden from you. Your choice is on the record. Meaning that I was losing living points every time. Living points being something like what we used to call brownie points when I was growing up, except that these were more critical than money for everything from getting a loan to getting a plane ticket to giving Gwen into net you one day, should we dream of doing that. A goal that people said involved tens of thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands of points. But I picked the animals up myself anyway, as did Eleanor when it was she who came upon them. And all because we wanted to dump the animals into Gwen's crib and hear her quick, cresting laughter as she immediately set about hurling them again. 
Everything was a game to her, a most wonderful, loving, endless game. Her spy eyes lit up with mischief. Her tea brown cheeks flushed the hot orange pink you see on the undersides of clouds at sunset. Often she laughed so hard she fell as she threw, plopping down on her soft bottom, but grabbing the crib rail so hard as she scrambled back up that the whole crib shook. Was this the delicate newborn we had once so anxiously tended? Now breathtakingly robust, indestructible it did seem, she wore an old time soft yellow blanket sleeper with attached feet and bunny ears, a hand knit extra warm version of a suit Eleanor remembered from her own childhood. None of this baby zone heating over Gwen's crib, in other words. She hardly seemed to need zone heat in any case, having learned so early to blow on her hands if they were cold, and to cuddle with us if she needed to for warmth. Indeed, we were all given to cuddling, and we all wore sweaters too to avoid turning on the zone heat, for which we were constantly house scolded. Don't you find it a bit chilly? Why not choose to turn on the zone heat? You'll be more comfortable. Don't you find it a bit chilly? But we ignored it. For this was how the auto house started, wasn't it? With thermostats that sent to Aunt Nettie first data, then videos. Then came drone deliverers and fridge stockers, kid trackers and robo-sitters, elder helpers and yard bots, all of which reported to Aunt Nettie as dutifully as any spy network, recording our steps, our pictures, our relationships, and back when we soon to be surplus still had them, our careers. And she, in turn, took what she knew and applied it, even proffering along the way solace and advice. Indeed, in the early days of automation, I myself brought up Ask Aunt Nettie more often than I care to recall and can still remember her consoling voice as she volunteered, I'm here, and insisted, I want to hear everything, and reassured me, of course you feel that way, Grant. How could you not? You're only human. I did laugh at that, you're only human. Still, I found not only that a part of me responded to the words, but that it responded deeply, that it listened gratefully, as Aunt Nettie advanced some surprisingly useful advice on a range of subjects, including the many, I hadn't realized how many, for which noble Eleanor had no time. Would someone like me, whose mother had had him with who needs them men, have trouble knowing how to be a father, for example? The answer to which was that, given what men could be, I might in fact be better off without a role model anyway. Or how about, did someone like me really need to own both black and brown shoes now that I was no longer teaching? The answer to which was yes, if I cared about social acceptance, which yes, my data showed that I did underneath, and which yes, really was just as well, correlated as such concern was with mental health, especially among unretrainables, such as, yes, she had heard I now was. Like others, I had allowed Aunt Nettie to keep my calendar back in the days when, as the young head of an English as a second language program, I still had immigrants to teach and obligations to juggle. This was some time ago now, back before ship him back, but like others then, I had also allowed Aunt Nettie to email people on my behalf, checking the mimic your voice option and marveling at just how perfectly she could replicate my ticks of phrasing, especially because I had in my youthful diligence sent so many thousands of emails. Indeed, Aunt Nettie had so much data on me that not even Eleanor could tell it was not I who had composed the messages she received from my account. And like others too, I had taken advantage of the easy tools offered to me and trained Aunt Nettie to write my lessons and my syllabi, even to generate sample sentences and punny jokes. Indeed, I trained her so well that I had more than once observed that an avatar could now run the class. As for why I did these things, I generally did them, I see now, because I appreciated some associated convenience which was to say, because I could be, as my mother liked to say, lazy as a rock at the bottom of a hill. And as for the resulting reality, 
Was it not disconcertingly like the sea level rise and heat and wind we knew long ago would come with climate change, but have since come to call normal? No one would have willfully chosen the stranding of whole office parks and schools and neighborhoods by the flooding we saw now. No one would have willfully chosen the generating of the places we called maroon places, just as no one would have chosen the extinction of frogs and of polar bears or the decimation of our pine and spruce forests by the explosion in the number of bark beetles. And yet, it was something we humans did finally choose. After all, it was not the earth that chose it or any other creature. It was we who made our world what it was. It was we who were responsible. Um, and then I'm just gonna read one more short section. This is from quite a bit later in the book. Um, at this point, Gwen has become a pitcher and um, she and her teammates are, are getting ready to play in the Olympics against China and Russia. Um, in this book, um, when, I, when I made um, baseball an Olympic sport, that was just artistic license, but it just so happens that um, baseball is gonna be an Olympic sport this summer. Um, and they're terrified looking at the China Russian team because they've been genetically improved. And that means, among other things, that they are all swing, all switch hitters. Perhaps all this was fear, pure and simple, on the part of Gwen's teammates. But feeding their obsession, of course, was the sense that baseball was more than a sport, that it was a crown jewel. There were people who said it wasn't even invented in America. There were people who pointed out it was mentioned by Jane Austen long before it was ever mentioned here. But if baseball took on a hallowed meaning, it took on that meaning in our American dreams. For was this not the level playing field we envisioned, the field on which people could show what they were made of? And didn't we Americans believe above all that everyone should have a real chance at bat. Didn't we believe that with the good of the team at heart, something in us might just hit a ball off our shoe tops and send it sailing clear out of the park? If Gwen's teammates were playing China Russia for something, I thought it was for this. For a chance to show, my mother would have said, that even if we all returned to the dirt and the wind and the rain like the plants and the animals, we had a bigness in us, something beyond algorithms and beyond upgrades, something we were proud to call human, or so it seemed to me. And I'll stop there. Mm. Hi, I, I very much enjoyed the book, and I was, and one of the parts that I enjoyed a lot was Grant always saying, as my mother would say, <laughs> and I was wondering where that came from. I don't know where it came from, and all the sayings are all made up, you know. Um, but this is a feminist book. I mean, I think there is a way in which, you know, just as now we're sort of thinking, well, what would it mean to have a woman president? You know, and there's all these little signs of, you know, I mean, we don't know if that will actually happen. But you know, as we begin to entertain that idea, you know, hear things like Kristen Gillibrand and and um, and Kamala Harris are in constant touch with Elizabeth Warren, kind of calling her up to see how she is. I think there's a way in which I think, starting with the Women's March, you know, I and many others have begun to wonder what would a more feminized world look like. You know what I mean? What would it look like if somebody like Grant, you know, actually grows up in a very female world because he doesn't have a father? And, um, and, and, you know, the voices that he hears are all feminine voices. Like, what would, what would that look like? What would he look like? Kind of to piggyback off of that, um, I've read this, I've read Mona, oh. and both books have such a distinct narrative voice. And, you know, I sit there reading it thinking you're like Daniel Day-Lewis, like getting in the <laughs> mindset of the narrator. Like, could you talk about the process of getting into the narrator's voice? Yeah, you know, the, of course, these voices are very different because Mona in the Promised Land has kind of a New York Jewish voice, right? Um, and I, the answer is, you know, I don't know where they come from. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, somebody once said that writing is like listening to a very soft voice. And, you know, I myself, I'm just listening. I, I don't know where it comes from. You know, I only know that I have to be very quiet to hear it, right? And I don't know why. Um, actually, this is not the only book in which people hear 
someone hears a dead person a lot. Um, in World in Town, I noticed my narrator also, um, she hears her husband and her best friend, their voices all the time. And I, I don't know where, I don't, I myself don't really hear <laughs> that I'm aware of. I don't really hear dead people talking. Um, but for whatever reason, my, my character seemed to do that. I, and I don't know why. <laughs> Um, but I, I, I will say that, you know, of course, the pitching, I had to do a lot of homework on the pitching. But it is true that, you know, my brother was, a, was an ace pitcher. And um, that was a very, it was a very odd thing because my parents knew nothing about sports. And uh, we were growing up in Yonkers, New York. And, um, but my brother was quite athletic. And so my father had signed him up with the Hillcrest Lakers Boys Club. I, I think just because my brother had a lot of energy and they just didn't know what to do with him. And and um, one of the coaches had figured out, you know, they, you know, they, they try the kids in all the different sports and all the different positions. And one of the one of the coaches figured out that my brother could throw. And my, my brother could really throw. I mean, he was one he was one of the top two pitchers in in the city. And Yonkers is a big city with a lot of a lot of very athletic kids. Um, and they take things like it was a working class neighborhood where they take sports very seriously. So like, you know, you miss a practice, you know, you're dropped from that team. And uh, the coach actually had played for the Chicago White Sox. So that, you know, these kids were really, it was kind of like the military. And, you know, my, my brother took to it immediately. And, you know, and so I think some of the scenes of Gwen in the backyard practicing, practicing, you know, I'm sure that, you know, I, you know they're, I'm drawing on memories from my childhood of my brother you know, practicing, practicing until he could hit those corners, you know. Um, my brother was good enough that, um, that when um, there was a, a father-son dinner um, that the Hillcrest Lakers Boys Club sponsored, um, he was introduced to Tom Seaver. Tom Seaver taught him to, to throw a, a curveball. And um, they introduced him, of course, as this Chinese kid, because they'd never seen anybody <laughs> who looked like my brother at all, much less somebody who looked like my brother who could pitch, you know? I mean, it was, the whole thing was mind-blowing to them. And they said, you know, we have this Chinese kid who can, you know, this Chinese kid is actually an American kid, and he's born here, but anyway. But they said, you know, we have this Chinese kid who can throw. You know, everyone's like, a Chinese kid who can throw? <laughs> Whoa, right? Um, anyway, and... Um, so there was my brother, you know, kind of, you know, he did grow up, he, and as a result, he had kind of this classic uh, ch American childhood. It's, it's very funny, but, you know, he was out playing in the streets, so, you know, he was one of those kids, you know, the foul go ball goes into the neighbor's yard, the neighbor takes the ball, she puts it on her driveway, they're playing with those spalding balls. She takes it and says, one more ball ball in my yard, and you know what's going to happen to it? And she takes it, and she takes a cleaver and goes, <laughs> You know, and then the kids they moved out. They moved out to a you know to a street that was where you know there were more cars. It wasn't as good to play on, but they had to because of this neighborhood. And uh, you know, one day, sure enough, this car was in the way, and uh, it was a Cadillac, and and the the, car, the 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 windows were half down, were cranked half down, you know, because it was hot. And one of the kids says to my brother, says, "Yeah, you can throw. I dare you to throw that ball right through that car." <laughs> Um, my brother, in a, in a rare show of good sense, um, actually said, um, no, I better not, because I just got in trouble for, you know, for batting this ball through this lady's window. It was just true. He had batted this ball right through this lady's bedroom window. And, uh, but interestingly, it's so, you know, and this is so interesting to me, the way that people learn about America and American rules and how things work here through a sport like baseball. My mother, who really truly knew, un understood nothing about America, nonetheless, when some lady came to the, you know, this lady came to the door and said, you know, your son has hit a ball through my window. What does my mother say? My mother says, that can't be right. My son is a pitcher and he would have had a designated hitter. <laughs> And meanwhile, his friend, by the way, did his friend did go ahead, and since my brother wouldn't do it, his friend threw a ball right through that Cadillac. <laughs> um, those kids all went to, to big big schools on big scholarships for sports. I mean, these kids were like, I mean, they were so athletic; it's a little frightening. Um, but um, anyway, so my brother had like a, a great time, and you know, and, and it, but it was like I say, it was it was his way, and I think and the whole sports thing was a way of his becoming American and feeling accepted and part of the scene. You know, it's like he, you know, he might be this Chinese kid, but he could throw, so he was okay. Do you know who Monet Davis is? Of course I know who Monet Davis is. Monet she, Davis is, is she a spirit behind? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So she, she, she pitched a shutout in the, in the Little Leagues, um, a girl. Philadelphia. Philadelphia, that's right, that's right, that's right. 
And um, although she went on, she's playing basketball now, right? She's she playing. would be, but she's playing softball at ah, Howard. Ah, good for her, good for her. Well, I've noticed in a lot of your work, there's a lot of technical stuff <laughs> that you have absorbed to the extent that it doesn't stick out. Hmm. That's a, a tremendous amount of work, isn't it? You know, I love the research, and but I'm, of course, I'm thrilled. I, I think the research fascinates me the way that writing fascinates me. Do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm fascinated by expertise. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm fascinated by what it takes to be a good pitcher, even though I myself don't pitch. Um, that said, that you know, it's kind of the big danger of people like me and all, all writers who love to do research. Is I mean, I'm thrilled to hear that it doesn't stick out because the the danger is that your book will become kind of research driven. And it's interesting, what I always tell students, you know, I always tell them is, do not take notes. And I said, because if you take notes, you're gonna write from your notes. And I always sort of say that if it's a good detail, you'll remember. Do you know what I mean? In this case, if it was something about the picture, something where I, I need it for the plot, I'll remember. And so I always use my memory to, to, to sift through it all because there's too much of it. And if, like I say, if you know, Knowing too much will, will kill your story. But, um, but it is true that as part of my research, I did read the biography and autobiography of every single woman pitcher. And, um, and you know, there's a way in which, um, not woman pitcher, I mean, also other, you know, other pitchers as well as, you know, Satchel Paige figures very largely in this book. Um, but um, but the, I was very interested in the women pictures, and you know, there's a way in which, of course, this, this book is a dystopia. But as, as you know, as every scholar will tell you, you know, dystopia and utopias are like this. And there's a way in which it is a dystopia, but it's also a utopia, in the sense that the parents, you know, develop this um, this underground league. For once they realize their daughter has this talent, um, they and they organize this league so that she can play, and you know, the league is kind of more egalitarian than baseball is in our country today, you know? So, um, so there's, so, you know, baseball are great, you know, the great metaphor for America is, as you know, in Major League Baseball, it's all male, funny. Um, and, um, you know, so I, you know, I had very much had in mind, you know, figures like, you know, Mamie Peanut Johnson, you know, played in the New Negro Wheel Leagues. Um, I like her, of course, because she's 5'3", 105 pounds in her uniform, soaking wet. <laughs> And, uh, but she could really throw, actually, Satchel Paige taught her to, to throw. And she could really throw. And, you know, in my, in this, in this, in this league, she would have gotten to play, you know? As it was, like I said, she played in the le le Negro Leagues and in the, went, uh, only in the women's, you know, parts of the Negro Leagues, you know, so. In this world, she would have had her chance. Um, at my mom's suggestion, I listened to the interview you did with Michael Krasny at KQED, uh, yeah, uh -huh. and um, a couple of things. One, uh, one of the callers called in and mentioned, with folded hands, uh, a science fiction novel that was written, I don't know, 20th century, in which technology had advanced to the point where robots were doing all the jobs and people had literally nothing to do. And I think that's the, the reference that he was drawing uh, to your book. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to ask you about, if you're willing to talk about it again, is you mentioned the chestnut cake um, <laughs> and the recipe for that and <laughs> how it kind of all came together. Sure. Um, so one thing I said, you know, he's talking about this interview that I did with Michael Krasny at KQD. So that was in San Francisco. So like 90% of the, of the questions were about technology. Technology, 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 understandably. And uh, we can talk about that if you want. But one of the other questions, um, I think maybe Michael asked me, you know, was kind of like how this book fits in with my other books, and particularly the book that, you know, the, the last book I did, which is The Girl of the Baggage Claim, Explaining the East-West Culture Gap. And um, this is not an obvious thing, um, but I will say that, you know, one of the things, I mean, so that book is very much about the individualistic self and what's known as the collectivistic self, although I, I don't use that term because I feel like people, they think they know what it means, but our ideas about it are so colored by the Cold War that it thinks it means everybody, do you know what I mean? It's a faceless mob, everybody does everything in lockstep, and that's not what it means at all. So I call it the flexi self. Um, but one thing about the flexi self as opposed to what I call the pit self, sort of a self that's, that's governed by an idea of the self that's like that you have a center that's like an avocado pit to which you must be true, you know? But I mean, like, truly, the rest of the world doesn't think this. We only think that in America. Um, 
But one of the big differences between these two salves is that the, you know, the avocado pit is very interested in categories. So they're very interested, they're looking, it's really, an, it's an interjected divinity, really, you know. So they're always looking in, trying to understand the nature of the self and its unique properties and defining it. And we project that outward. And so we, you know, we have all these categories. And so we're always looking at categories and trying to understand the nature of the pit inside that category. We do this, by the way, even when we read. So that, um, so individualistic, if you have a passage, uh, a, um, a researcher at Cornell named Chi Wong did this study, where she looked at, at you know, European American um, readers at Cornell, and, and people who had, Asian Americans who had been born in Asia, but who had come like when they were five years old. So, you know, they were fully fluent in English. And they looked at how they, how they broke down a reading passage and the European, um, the European American readers were very interested in the nature of each phrase. And so they broke it down into many, many more segments than the Asian Americans who are more interested in the overall meaning of the passage. So one is interested in making distinction, distinction, distinction. What is the nature of this thing? And the other is interested, well, what does this passage as a whole tell us? You know what I mean? And if it doesn't, if, if, if it doesn't matter, you know, I went upstairs and then I took a shower, it doesn't matter, you know, the idea is that you were not paying attention, you know, you were going on to another activity. You don't have to break down, I went upstairs and I took a shower. To the Asian Americans, they would put those two things together. European Americans tend to separate those phrases as separate units. Um, but the result is that there's, a, there's an intense interest in categorization. So you can sort of see it, like took a shower, went upstairs, those are two different things. What is the nature of that thing, you know? And not that interested in blurring those lines very interested in maintaining the boundaries the way we maintain our boundaries between people, right? So um, similarly, so we, and, then, and then we like our category, therefore we like our categories kind of clean. So a chest, the reason I say this about the chestnut cake, so, you know, for, for Chinese New Year's, you know, we frequently have a chestnut cake. Um, we have a chestnut cake because my mother grew up in the French concession in Shanghai. So this was kind of the home cake, you know, they had, chestnut cakes every year, so that's fine. Um, but what the Chinese do with the chestnut cake and the cake we had just this year, they took the chestnut cake, which you might recognize from any you know, French bakery, and at the bottom layer, they put frosted flakes. <laughs> and so this is like, I thought, you know, you'll see this often kind of like this jumbling of categories. And the answer is, in their mind, they don't care that these two things are from different categories. All they want to know is, does it taste good? And you know what? It did taste good. <laughs> Actually, it tastes a lot better than a chestnut cake without, without the crunch at the bottom. Actually, it was great. Um, but this is a, it's a way of thinking. You know what I mean? In other words, it, there's, a way, there's a way in which the flexi self is much more interested in morphing, not so interested in, ma in maintaining those kind of boundaries. Um, and I would argue gives, you know, gives rise to a certain kind of creativity. You know, I don't think that either is, I think it's six and one, half dozen the other. I think we can have greatness on both sides. But you can see this a little bit, you know, this difference that I'm talking about, you can see a little bit in movie making. If you think about Ang Lee, Ang Lee can go from Sense and Sensibility to Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, to Life of Pi, to The Hulk without skipping a beat, right? And under the, you wouldn't say they weren't all him. Definitely, you definitely see it's him all the way. But he does not, you know, he, there's a kind of freedom there. Do you know what I mean? It's like, oh, I'm gonna do this, and then I'm gonna do that, and I'm gonna do this. Um, you know, whereas, we, you know, um, the, the um, uh, directors that we might think of as more big pit um, directors, like, you know, say Wes Anderson or Woody Allen, you know, they have an identify, they have a thing that they do. And, you know, you can see that pit in every single thing they do. It's different things, but it's quite, it's, you know what I mean? They stay within their, their thing. Um, and I think, like I say, these are two very different models of creativity. Um, one, one model much more interested in genius, one more interested in mastery, you know? Um, I think we could go through this argument. I do talk about a lot of it, talk about it a lot in Girl with the Baggage Claim. But honestly, we have masterpieces of great, great masterpieces on both sides. So if you think about the, the, um, the flexi self model, which is often, often not that interested, because it's not so interested in it must originate here. Very much more comfortable with taking an existing model. So if you think about 
but, but it can still lead to greatness. So if you think about like all those Majana and Childs that they did, you know, forever, right? And that was the template. So that's the flexi self and you know what I mean? There's, there's an existing tradition and you work within it. But within that tradition, we still have Giotto, right? I mean, there are still people, you know, just like the Chinese landscape paintings, you could sort of say they all look the same except they don't look the same. Actually, within that tradition, there, there are paintings like Fang Quan. I mean, you look at this painting, it is indisputably great, you know? It's just a different way of being great. And so I would just sort of say that, you know, anyway, I'm not saying that my work is great, but I can, I say, I can see this, in, you know, this, this um, comfort with morphing and changing genre. You can sort of say I've changed, I've changed um, narrative strategy pretty much with every book since the beginning. With this is maybe me the most dramatic, you know, change. But, you know, their nonfiction, you know what I mean? Fiction, nonfiction, you know, I can, I can, I can shapeshift very easily. And I do think that that comfort with shapeshifting um, comes from my Eastern roots. That's a long answer. I didn't have time for all of that on Michael Crasty's show. <laughs> if I'd done that, you know what I mean? That would have been like the whole half hour right there, right? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>